Well, we're right in the middle of our big um, integral chapter, and tonight we're going to introduce you to a brand new antiderivative rule. But before we introduce you to the new rule, um, and which is going to revolve around exponential functions tonight, and you could already start to kind of anticipate and imagine the types of problems we're going to be integrating. We're going to see a lot of e's tonight. We're going to be integrating e to the 2x or e to the whatever x power. Um, to the, I just want to quickly recap where we've been so far. The first antiderivative we did was the power rule. We basically said, what if I've got x to the nth power? And basically, um, we're going to say, well, it's, the antiderivative is x to the n plus 1. We're going to then divide by the new exponent. There's your new coefficient. Of course, we've got our plus c. And that rule is legit as long as n's not equal to negative 1. And then we talked about integrating all of our trig functions. Um, for instance, we might have uh, you know, integrated secant squared, and we said the antiderivative of secant squared was simply tangent. There was a grand total of, of six basic trig rules that we introduced you to. Then we took a look at um, just a very generic u sub. We introduced you to the idea of, you know, how do I integrate, um, you know, the opposite of chain rule, basically. This is like anti-chain rule, I call it. And we said if you, if you get an integral in this form, we're going to let u equal the inner function. And then, you know, by the time we calculate du and solve for dx, we're going to be able to cancel out all the x's. And then we, and basically we said u sub is going to be a technique that carries through through the rest of these problems. And we introduced you to a very special one, du over u, the other day. And that turns out to be the natural log of the absolute value of u plus c. So these are the four big themes that we've seen so far in terms of an indefinite integral. And we're going to just go ahead and add one more to that list tonight. So I just kind of want to play around with some exponential functions here just to get our mind uh, warmed up and in shape. And uh, we'll just get start the process of thinking backwards. And I just want to recall, if we were to derive, let's see, my D looks like a D. If I wanted you to derive e to the 2x, what would we say? You'd say it's going to be 2e to the 2x would be his derivative. Notice there's no plus c on the derivative. Don't, don't get too crazy with that plus c. So basically what we're saying then is if you want to integrate 2e to the 2x with respect to x, then you'll get e to the 2x plus c as the antiderivative. Or um, maybe we wanted to derive 1 third e to the 3x. You know, by the, uh, by the time I derive to the exponent, I would end up with a derivative of just e to the 3x. And so if you want to integrate e to the 3x, his antiderivative would be 1 third e to the 3x plus c. So when you're thinking backwards here, you kind of have to anticipate who the new coefficient's going to be. And that's going to be one of our more interesting challenges tonight. So on the surface, this is going to, just like when we derived exponential functions, it was probably one of the easiest rules ever. Um, the integral on the surface is a very easy rule. So generically, we'll say the antiderivative of e to the x, whoops, that should be an x, with respect to x is simply that same function, e to the x plus c. If, uh, you know, if you derive e to the x, you get e to the x, or if you integrate e to the x, you'll get e to the x. Uh, more generically speaking, in terms of u, now remember, u is a function of x. Um, the antiderivative of e to the u is simply e to the u plus c. So pretty simple one. Once you get it in this form, the challenge tonight is going to be creating and getting it into this form right here. Um, so what you're going to see is, you know, I would say probably at least 90% of the time, and I may be underselling that a little bit, uh, we are going to let u equal the exponent. That is our theme tonight, is we're going to let u equal the exponent. There's very few exceptions to that, um, and, and you'll know right away if, you, if it is one of those exceptions. You'll just see that the x's don't cancel, and you got to go back and try something else. But let's start with that idea, that premise every time, that we're going to let u equal that exponent. Okay, so here's our first live example. Um, let's say we wanted to integrate e raised to the 3x plus 1 power. And so just like we said in the last problem, we're going to start off by letting u equal the exponent. So his, uh, the derivative of u is going to be 3 times dx. We're going to instantly solve for dx. And then we'll just start all of our substitutions. I'm going to substitute a u in for the exponent right there. I'm going to substitute du over 3 in for my dx, and here's what's going to look like. I now have e to the u and du over 3. What I like to do is I just like to rewrite it with the coefficient out front. So I've got one third integral of e to the u du. You'll notice what I've done is I've 
I've rewritten the problem so it fits my new rule perfectly. We've kind of created that mold, so to speak. So the antiderivative is e to the u plus c. And if we rewrite it in terms of x, remember it's an indefinite integral. So I'm obviously I'm going to definitely rewrite it in terms of x. That u is uh, 3x. I almost forgot my 3 plus 1. And then you got your plus c. Our second example has got a very peculiar element to it. We're going to do e raised to the negative x squared power. Get the squared in there. So instantly we're going to let u equal the exponent. And maybe you already feel something fishy about this problem. The derivative is negative 2x dx. And we instantly solve for the dx. So I get du over negative 2x dx. All right, equals dx. Whoop, lost my blue there. Okay. All right, um, let's see what we got cooking here. So let's substitute the u in for the exponent right there. We'll substitute du over negative 2x in for my dx. And let's see what's so crazy about this problem. There's something that I really want you to pick up on. Let's see, du over negative 2x. All right, so what's the big problem? We have a monster problem here right now. We are unable to cancel all of the what? Yeah, we're unable to cancel all the x's. This x right here has nobody else to cancel with. I wish there was an x right here in order to cancel this x right here, but there's not. So what we need to say right now is we cannot do this problem, all right? Um, we may learn some tricks later in the year that help us jump around this obstacle, but right now with the rule we have tonight, we cannot integrate this problem. And I just wanted to show you one that has a very, um, I guess, uh, strong dead end. You know, we're not able to cancel the x's and this is where we've hit our dead end. We can either go back and try a different u, uh, but for the sake of time I'm just showing you tonight that this one cannot be done. Alright, now number three is going to look very similar to the last one. Let's try 5x times e to the negative x squared power. So you see we have a similar um, you know, we've got the e to the negative x squared, but let's see if this one works out any better than the last one. And maybe you already have a strong gut feeling, and you can kind of foresee what's happening here as, the, as this problem develops. Whoops. Um, let's just let u equal negative x squared. As I derive it, I'll get negative 2x times dx. Instantly solve for that dx. And so we motor through that portion pretty quickly. Now let's go ahead and make the appropriate substitutions. I still have the 5x, but now the e is being raised to the u power, and then the dx became a du over negative 2x. So what's the good news here? The good news is that now I am able to cancel the x's, unlike the last problem. And let's just clean it up. Let's pull out the coefficient. We're going to be nice, neat, and tidy here. Good habits prevent careless mistakes. I'm a big believer in that. You know, let's be careful. Let's take our time. So the antiderivative of this expression right here is simply e to the u plus c. So the coefficient simply comes along for the ride. Here's my antiderivative. And let's rewrite it one more time so that's in terms of x. And we have our official antiderivative. And, of course, you could derive this little expression here to see if it gave you the original problem. All right, on example number four, this is a great time. I think you've, you're finally comfortable enough to hit the pause button and try this one all on your own. And there is one miniature little bear trap in this one that I want you to be on your toes for. But go ahead, hit that pause button, come on back and see how we do. Okay, so I've already took the liberty of starting. I let u equal my exponent. And here was that miniature little bear trap. The derivative of cosine of a, is, of course, negative sine. So we just got to be really careful and keep an eye on that negative all the way through the problem. I don't want to get rushing too fast where I lose track of that rascal. And so let's rewrite this. I've got the integral of sine x times e to the u. And I'm going to substitute du divided by negative sine in for dx. I, I have a great feeling. I can see the cancellation coming. We were able to cancel every term that possessed an x. But I am going to just take that negative sign and slide him out front. So I've got the negation of the integral of e to the u du. Uh, simply, you know, I've rewritten it in the form that I want. So I'm just going to negate the antiderivative. And this is negative e to the cosine x power plus c. Our fifth example, another great one. Um, let's let's use the, the discipline necessary to go ahead and hit that pause button. We do have a fraction. It's e to the 1 divided by x power divided by x squared. Now you've got two rules that I've given you kind of conflicting with each other. Um, two videos ago I said, hey, if you're ever integrating a fraction, you've got to let u equal the denominator, right? 
And now today I said if you're ever integrating a, a you know, an E function, you've got to let U equal the exponent. So you've got two things that are conflicting with each other. And I'm going to let you try to decide who to let U equal so that you get the appropriate cancellations and the appropriate integral worked up. So, um, you know, go ahead, try, try um, you know, whatever you think uh, comes to mind and see if it works and come on back and see if we agree. All right, here's what I've got so far. I went with the exponent. I kind of had a better feeling about that one. I could kind of see the derivative in my mind and see that it's going to hopefully cancel out the x squared on the bottom here. Um, vice versa, I was, if I let u equal the x squared, I didn't foresee it ever canceling this term up here. So uh, that's kind of how I made my de uh, determining factor. But, you know, I let u equal uh, 1 over x, and I rewrote it as x to the negative 1 so I could derive it a little easier. Now I'm going to go in slow motion here this first time, and I'm going to say, well, that's really negative dx over x squared, right? And so now as I solve for dx, I could say, well, that's negative x squared times du. I think it's really important to notice that now um, the x squared is in the numerator with the du. So let's go ahead and make some good substitutions here. This is going to be the integral of e to the u divided by x squared and times negative x squared divided by du. Sometimes I like to put that expression over 1 just to emphasize who's in the numerator versus who's in the denominator. Now we can see the great cancellation taking place. We've successfully killed all the x's. I'm going to rewrite it so that I don't lose the negative sign. We now have it in the very friendly format of e to the u du, whose antiderivative is e to the u plus c. So, um, and then we'll just rewrite it in terms of x. So I believe that was um, the u was 1 over x. And bada bing, there we go. All right. In our next example here, we're going to start to look at some definite integrals. Okay. And all that, what does that mean to you? What are you anticipating all of a sudden? You're anticipating an integral that has bounds on it, right? And so our answer all of a sudden is not going to be a function with a plus c at the end like it has been all day so far tonight. Now all of a sudden our answer is going to be a numerical value, and that numerical value measures what? You know, hopefully your first thought was, well, it's going to measure the area bounded by between this function and the x-axis and also bounded by the vertical line x equals 0 and x equals 1. Now when I look at a problem like this, my first advice is to watch your signs. You know, you see a negative sign on that exponent. I don't want to lose that negative, and it's going to create a negative coefficient by the time I integrate it. So here's what I've got cooking here. I'm going to let u equal the exponent. The derivative is a very simple negative dx, so all i got to do is move the negative over. Now, I also want to rewrite the bounds in terms of u. So this is, we've got to really watch our signs and be careful. The new lower bound is still 0, but the new upper bound, because of this statement, is negative 1. I've got e to the u power, and then I'm substituting negative du into it. Now you'll notice if I pull this negative out, we would actually have two negatives because I'm going to switch the bounds, right? And in order to switch the bounds, I now have two negatives, which make a positive, conveniently. All right. Now as we integrate this, remember, we do not need to rewrite the antiderivative in terms of x because the bounds are already adjusted accordingly. We've, our first fundamental theorem says we'll plug in the upper bound, and then we'll subtract, and we'll plug in the lower bound. So all I have is 1 minus 1 over e, and that's the numerical value of the area bounded between that curve and the x-axis. Now our big point of emphasis at the beginning was that if you're integrating an expression with e's in it, we're always going to let u equal the exponent. And that has been the case so far. But we said that wouldn't be true 100% of the time. And so I want to show you a few counterexamples where that wouldn't be the case. And so I want to do another definite integral from 0 to 1. Notice the bounds are very friendly. I don't know as we could um, you know, have easier, friendlier bounds to work with. So here's the expression, and again, we're just finding the area bounded between this interesting curve and the x-axis, and um, I'm integrating a fraction, and so that was another, you know, like we talked about a couple problems ago, we could let u equal the denominator, and I think that's going to be a great idea. His derivative is simply e to the x times dx, and we'll go ahead and solve for dx and get this expression here. So what are the new bounds? Well, 
this is, uh, if I plug a 0 in for this x, I'm going to get 1 plus 1, which is 2. If I plug a 1 in, I'm going to get 1 plus e for the upper bound. Interesting upper bound, to say the least. All right, our numerator is e to the x. My denominator is u, and I'm substituting du over e to the x. And we could celebrate right here because we do get a cancellation. We have successfully eliminated all of the x's. But what rule do we have? Do we have the same rule we've been working with all day today? Um, I, great time, if, you, if you've been following me so far on this problem, great time to hit that pause button. Make sure you've got the, you can get the right antiderivative and plug those bounds in, okay? All right, this is what I had. I had, you know, I'm really integrating du over u, which is a lot different than e to the u. His antiderivative is the natural log of u. I'm not going to worry about the absolute values because I already know my two numbers are already positive. And I'm going to get the natural log of the quantity 1 plus e, which I cannot simplify, minus the natural log of 2. I cannot expand that first term out because there's a plus sign already in the middle. But what I can do is I can condense these two terms and say, well, it's the natural log of 1 plus e divided by 2. And that, ladies and gentlemen, would be my final answer. All right, you're probably pretty worn out already tonight. I've given you a lot of problems, and I, I don't think there's, you know, there's no substitute for too many repetitions. And, and I just want to give you enough so that you feel confident coming into class tomorrow ready to rock and roll. So here's another definite integral. It's e to the x times the cosine of e to the x. And again, we've got to think outside the box a little bit. If I just went with letting u equal my exponent of x, it really wouldn't get me anywhere where I needed to be. And you can go ahead and try it and see what it looks like. It just wouldn't get us anywhere. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to let u equal the inner function right here. I'm going to let u equal e to the x. And his derivative is e to the x times dx. And we'll go ahead and divide that over. So let's go ahead and rewrite our integral. Uh, my new lower bound is e to the negative 1, or 1 over e. My new upper bound is 1. And what do I have here? I've got e to the x times the cosine of u. Notice, okay, and again, this just comes with practice. I didn't let this expression equal u. I was focusing on this one right here because he was the inner function. All right, and then I've got my du divided by e to the x. The great news is... These bears cancel, and I've now successfully rewritten. Oops, I want to move. Okay, all right. Just to clean up the integral here a little bit so you can see it more clearly, we're integrating the cosine of u with respect to u. That's a very famous integral. His antiderivative is simply the sine of u with bounds of 1 over e and 1. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to plug those in. And I know they're not friendly numbers. I don't know what the sine of 1 is. I don't know what the sine of 1 over e is, but I do know that this is some numerical value, and that represents the area bounded by that region in the x-axis. So I hope you've got the new rule down. If nothing else, we're going to walk in tomorrow, and we're going to know that the antiderivative of e to the u is e to the u plus c. So that's our number one goal for tomorrow, and we're going to practice determining what to let u equal. 99, or I shouldn't say 99, probably at least 90% of the time, u is going to be the exponent. But our last two examples showed you some cases where it may not be. We may let u equal the denominator. We may let u equal the inner function. It's a problem-to-problem -problem decision. So good luck, and we'll see you tomorrow.